Hello, everyone. I am really excited to be here with you all, and I'm thrilled to have with us Dr. Ariel Schwartz. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you, Simon. It is lovely to be here with you. I'm really looking forward to our talk. I just want to tell people a little bit about you. Uh, Dr. Ariel Schwartz is a licensed clinical psychologist, a certified complex trauma professional, and a Kripalo yoga teacher. With a private practice in Boulder, Colorado, and her integrative mind-body approach to therapy includes relationship therapy, parts work therapy, somatic psychology, EMDR therapy, and therapeutic yoga for trauma. Ariel, it is so lovely to have you here. I've been listening to all your seminars online, and uh, I've got lots of questions for you, and I'm really looking forward to see what you have to say. Um, is it possible we could begin by just clarifying that I understand you're a somatic psychologist. Can you tell us briefly what that means? Yes, I'm happy to. So I began studying somatic psychology back in the mid-1990s when, honestly, nobody knew what it was. <laughs> and, um, and just by definition, what we're talking about is soma in Greek means body. And psychology, of course, we understand is the study of. And so it's really incorporating the body into psychotherapy. And we recognize nowadays that when we look at stressful life events or traumatic life events, that the body bears the burden or keeps the score of those experiences and that talk therapy can only take us so far. So it's really about how are we attending to the impact of adversity that lives in our soma, but also how do we build a sense of resource and connection and a felt experience of integrity also in the body. Uh, I was about to ask you, you know, how did you initially decide to focus on embodiment as a part of psychotherapy? But you've sort of answered that. Is there anything more you'd like to say with respect to that? Yeah, I think I might share just a little bit about my own personal background and, and what drew me to this. I I was actually 23 when I began to study somatic psychology formally, although I would say that I've been studying this field for my entire life, uh, really beginning in the sense of uh, experientially and, and perhaps as a result of my own trauma as a child, being someone that was very sensitive and felt everything really deeply, kind of a high empathy factor in a family where there was also a lot of unprocessed trauma among my parents and then an early divorce that began at the age of two. And so I absorbed everything and I didn't have language enough to process it. And, and my parents were both in a lot of their own overwhelm. And so the way that it showed up for me was in my own body. And in the experience of getting sick a lot and the experience of feeling pretty burdened with anxiety and depression and a lot of somatic experiences that accompanied that. And the things that helped me the most were things like going to yoga, being out in nature, being able to move my body. That's when I felt most free. And so when I first learned about the, that there was a thing that I could study called somatic psychology, I was like, oh, that's, that's for me. That's what I want to do, both to heal myself, but also that's what I want to do in the world to help others as well. Oh, that, that's so wonderful. I can so resonate with that because sometimes people ask me, how did I learn what I do as a physiotherapist? And I have this list of about a hundred injuries, yes. which I've done to myself. And the injuries which I've done to myself and managed in some way are the things I'm best at healing. And something that I've not related to myself, I don't, I'm okay with, but you can't heal as well. So I think that you've had that experience has probably made you an excellent therapist. So, mm. so thank you for sharing that. Can, can I ask also, you offer applied polyvagal theory in therapy and in yoga as well. For the audience, can you just quickly give your take on what is polyvagal theory and why this is beneficial for the healing of trauma? Yeah, absolutely. It's a complex topic and it's something that I'll try and offer in its most simplest terms here. So first of all, the vagal part of polyvagal refers to the vagus nerve. 
And the vagus nerve is our 10th cranial nerve. Uh, the vagus is Latin for wandering. And if you kind of trace the vagus nerve through the body, it's it's very far reaching. It's far, far extending. It wanders through the body, if you want to think about it that way. And uh, the vagus nerve travels up into our face. It interfaces around our eyes and ears and the muscles, our smile muscles, into our throat and uh, the larynx and pharynx in the throat, around our heart and lungs. So our breathing mechanism is very tied into the vagus nerve. And then through the diaphragm all the way down into our gut. So we think of the vagus nerve as this uh, mind-body communication highway. In particular, it's sending information from the body up to the brain so that our brain can utilize the information from the body to help us be more regulated or respond effectively to our world. And unfortunately, the accumulation of stress and trauma can bear its burden there as well, and our autonomic nervous system can get out of balance. So we see this dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system where we get stuck in either fight and flight and we're go, 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 or we get stuck in a certain amount of shutdown or collapse. Ideally, the health of the autonomic nervous system is actually a really beautiful balance between sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems. And within the sympathetic system, we are um, able to mobilize in the world. And when we feel safe, we can mobilize for the purpose of climbing a mountain or, you know, dancing or doing yoga or, you know, being able to be free to move. But when we're under stress, the sympathetic nervous system will take us into guardedness and defensiveness and fight and flight. And it helps us, again, mobilize in response to survival. The parasympathetic nervous system ideally brings us into rest and digest. Okay. And it lets us restore and, and regenerate all of the cellular systems of the body. But unfortunately, under the experience of severe trauma where there's no escape, that parasympathetic nervous system can also become dysregulated, in which case it goes to an evolutionarily older expression, one that leads us to withdraw or collapse or sometimes even faint. So the vagus nerve is always about accessing the parasympathetic nervous system. Polyvagal refers to poly is, is multiple or many. Right? So it refers to that we have more than one vagal circuit. We have two vagal circuits, one that's evolutionarily older, that's corresponding to that self-protection or shutdown response. You can think about reptiles, for example, and the way that they will become profoundly still in order to avoid being perceived or seen or sensed by a predator. You know, a chameleon, for example, will completely blend into its environment. It will gray rock, if you think about it that way. It'll, it'll match the environment to disappear. And we as humans are still in some ways equipped with that capacity to freeze or disappear um, and to not be seen by what is that potential source of threat. You can also think of a possum, for example, that might go into a, a faint response and um, a, you know, a, a deep shutdown in hopes that the predator would lose interest in the dead animal. Right? So polyvagal theory is accounting for these two expressions of the vagus nerve, one that can let us rest and digest and also bond and connect with others. The, the more recently evolved pathway or circuit of the vagus nerve is called the social engagement system. And Dr. Stephen Porges, who developed polyvagal theory, has really illuminated a lot more about what the functions are of that social engagement system which in short lets us um, kind of dial down our defensive reactivity for the purpose of bonding with others. So mammals that need to be in close proximity to our caregivers, to nurse, or even um, adult mammals that need to be able to let go of defensive responding to give birth. So it allows us to immobilize or let go of physical tension in order to promote um, the survival of the species as well, but in a loving, caring way. So we think of things like compassion and loving kindness and connecting to the heart 
connecting to your breath and those upper pathways of the vagus nerve as ways to key into that more evolutionary um, recent strategy of human potential. You know, I live in Australia and I'm constantly driving down the road. I live in the country and I'm seeing koala, possum, wombat, and the lights shine on them and they just freeze (laughs) in the middle of the street. And I I think this is what you're talking about a little bit. They're totally relaxed. Yeah. And that's very, very exciting. It's very interesting. Can, Can you offer some tools to rewire your resilience, you know, for people um, to, to, um, to feel better about themselves? And, and what does it mean? Uh, and how is it connected to things like neuroplasticity? Yeah, yeah. So neuroplasticity is really recognizing that our brains and our nervous systems are constantly available for change. It used to be thought that our brains were only plastic during a specific window of time right at, right after we were born. But now we recognize that our nervous systems are rather plastic all throughout the lifespan. And plasticity, again, just means changeable, right? Um, malleable in some way. So that can work in our favor and it can also work against us. Uh, Sometimes we can think of post-traumatic stress um, when it's repeated, when those symptoms linger over and over and over as a form of stress-induced neuroplasticity. Whatever it is that we repeat gets wired in. Any new behavior also can get wired in, right? So if we have something that's chronically stressful, that gets wired into our nervous system. But the good news is that we can also promote what we call growth promoting neuroplasticity or positive neuroplasticity, which is basically facilitating growth and change in a, in a wanted direction. So in that case, we can build in through repeated practice, the ability to access positive or nourishing states in our nervous system and emotionally and with other people, right? Another key element of of, uh, polyvagal theory is what we call co-regulation, which means that my nervous system is going to impact yours and yours is going to impact mine. So we are changing each other as well. In fact, we know that our brains are wired for relationships, right? To be changed by relationships. And ideally, we have those sources of nourishment in our social arenas so that we can actually allow ourselves to grow in that positive direction through connection. You know, I would say that um, when we're rewiring something like resilience, what we need to think about is that we want to access a a positive emotional state, and we want to linger there. We want to savor it. We want to repeat the things that support us in that nourishing direction. And this doesn't mean that it's going to take away the pain or the distress or the wounds that we might experience in life. There's a certain amount of suffering is inevitable, right? But that it gives us a broader container that helps us turn towards our wounds while simultaneously being connected to our resources so that we can basically handle more. Um, We're more resilient to stress because we can come back to that state of resource. And I I just want to say it's not about like pushing away negative feelings. It's not about toxic positivity, right? It's about building more capacity so that when I feel self-compassion, for example, I can then turn towards my grief or my fear or my sadness, and I can hold that really tenderly and really lovingly without feeling like I get swallowed by it. That's fascinating. You know, last year I met uh, Dr. Norman Deutsch, who talks a lot about neuroplasticity, and it was really interesting to talk about um, the the different sides of the brain. And I was asking him how they thought for a long time that left brain was more uh, logical and right brain was more intuitive. And I said, is this still, you know, a a thought that they have? And he said, yes, pretty much it is. But I've always been wondering about the the, uh, logical and intuitive relationship between the thinking brain in your head and the enteric nervous system or gut brain. Can you talk a little bit perhaps for me about the relationship between your work and the enteric nervous system or what euphemistically people call that gut brain? Yes. Yeah. I I think it's a beautiful question. It's something that I'm um, kind of deeply tapped into in this work. And how do we 
access the uh, the wisdom of our intuitive and instinctual self. So what we know about the gut brain, for example, is that our intestines have all of the same neurotransmitters that we, we used to think only lived in our uh, the brain that lives in our head. And so then we go, wow, okay, there's a whole lot of intelligence and there's this communication that's happening between what our gut knows and what our how our brains can then use that information, the felt sense information. And I often think that our guts are so intelligent because they're really simple, right? In the sense of this either is good for me or it's poisonous, right? And our gut knows how to differentiate between nourishment and waste or toxins, right? And does a really brilliant job in ideally does a really brilliant job in differentiating between these. I'm going to absorb that. That's nourishing for my system. And I'm going to excrete that. That's not healthy for me. I don't want that. And I'm going to reject that, right? Because that could kill me. So our gut has these kind of three states of, of wise responding. And it's true about food. And it's also true about our psychological life experiences. We know intuitively what people or places are nourishing and which feel toxic, which feel not healthy for us, not something that I want in me, right? Or around me or as part of me. And so our guts are, are help us discern. They're a discernment system. And if we override that gut wisdom um, and we stop listening, that's when things can start to go awry. I'm totally excited by this. It's it's so fascinating. It's you know, trust your gut feeling is something which people always suspected from a very long time ago. But that that science now exists that we really can trust our gut feeling is quite incredible. I'm yeah. completely uh, obsessed in my work with the with the gut brain because yeah. uh, as a physiotherapist for many years people were telling everyone to lock their core, to tighten the pelvic floor, to draw their navel to the spine. And this actually inhibits your gut brain and it actually causes a lot of stress and a lot of tension. So do you talk to your clients about things like the pelvic floor, which I think also has relation to the vagal nerve as well, doesn't it? Okay. And also the abdomen. Do you get people to work with their pelvic floor or abdomen in certain ways as well and how it relates to gut brain and things like that? I work especially with the diaphragm and the psoas, which of course that whole that that whole area that you're speaking of, of pelvic floor, psoas and diaphragm, and then our breathing mechanism, they're all interconnected. And in fact, if we really just broaden this out to the connective tissue or the fascia of the body, that is where all of this interconnection is best understood. And we've long known that diaphragmatic breathing is a key to well-being. It, it helps to um, actualize that, that rest and digest response. It, it gets the relaxation response going. But now we can start to recognize a little bit more about the why, because the diaphragm is almost all connective tissue fibers. And the connective tissue of the diaphragm connects down into the connective tissue of the psoas and then all the way down to the, to the diaphragm of the pelvic floor. There We have multiple diaphragms. You know this. I know this, right? And also, we recognize that the diaphragm has vagal, vagal uh, excuse me, uh, connective tissue fibers that connect around the pericardium of the heart, which is the, the connective tissue around the heart. So when we take a deep belly breath, as you're describing, that need to soften the belly and move the belly as we breathe, that is going to expand the cavity around our lungs and heart. It will increase the volume of the heart. Literally, we grow our heart with a deep belly breath. And that's going to change the amount of oxygenated blood that flows through the body. It's going to send signals back up to the brainstem that says we're safe now, right? And that all of the, the organizing systems that either are taking us into fight flight, right? And our psoas muscles are so key in that. They prepare us to run. They prepare us to, to fight back, right? They protect our, our digestive organs by drawing the knees in close. So the psoas muscles get to relax. The pelvic floor gets to relax. And, and the 
interconnection between the fascial system and the vagus nerve is, um, is I think, again, a new frontier of how those changes in the fascia are being carried via vagus nerve up to the brainstem so that these changes can be recognized and registered. Wow, that's fantastic. I am totally thrilled that you mentioned the psoas and the diaphragm. When I mentioned the core, your first things were to say psoas and diaphragm. And uh, as a physiotherapist, many people in the modern world are obsessed with tightening their core. And they only usually talk about the rectus abdominis and these you know, major abdominal muscles. But I think the most important core muscles are the ones you've mentioned, really the diaphragm at the top of the core, the pelvic floor at the bottom, and the psoas, which of course connects to the diaphragm. So can you talk a little bit more about the psoas and the relationship with your work and how it relates to polyvagal theory, perhaps? Yeah, sure. You know, I'm going to reference a little bit of David Berselli's work as well. And, and if you're not familiar with him, um, he developed the tension and trauma release exercises or the TREs. And so a lot of his work is also recognizing that when we're carrying tension or trauma, we tend to carry that in the psoas muscles as well. And so the purpose of TRE exercises, and it goes all the way back, even before Berselli, back to bioenergetics or even Reiki and somatic uh, therapy. But we recognize that that when we can find ways to begin to release the psoas, um, that we start to notice that the body has other related releases. We might feel an emotional release, or we might feel a little trembling that moves down through the legs. And so he creates these opportunities for basically tremoring or releasing the muscles of the psoas, which then will feel all throughout the system. I mean, it's amazing to me the way that it can release shoulder tension, right? Or tension around the base of the skull or tension headaches um, because of that connective tissue experience and being able to shift the body out of that fight flight response. And, you know, you said something about, um, you know, how, how might we access this or, or really create safety? And I think that, you know, working with the, the hips or the pelvic floor or the, the belly or the psoas muscles, it can be really tender when someone has a history of trauma, especially sexual trauma, because, uh, you know, there's an understandable bracing and self-protection that may have come in um, at that time. And so I always think that when we're working with any kind of somatic release practices, that slower, mindful, pacing, really listening to your body that you don't have to do anything that ever feels aggressive or pushing yourself to release too quickly. It, it's like a rubber band. It'll snap back, right? So, so we, we want to cultivate, and this is where vagus nerve comes in because we want to orient to safety and connection. And when we feel safe enough, then our bodies will naturally begin to let go of some of that tension as well. I think this is really important, what you've just said, that uh, when people do somatic work in, in lay language, just basically things which people consider exercise or movement or posture or anything like that, that we move away from these paradigms of no pain, no gain, survival of the fittest. Uh, you know, if you're good, you're going to go to heaven. If you're bad, you're going to go to hell. I always try and tell my clients, when you practice, make it feel good while you're doing it. Don't look for an end goal. Don't look for strength or flexibility make it enjoyable and and one of the common axioms in australian physiotherapy is uh, and maybe it's around the world but uh, exercise is optional but movement is essential mm -hmm. and so to just get people really be comfortable practicing i think is really important it sounds like that's what you're getting people to do i mean you are speaking my language and it's so it's so fun to listen to you because when i'm teaching therapeutic yoga for example i'm always using phrases like let it feel good i I borrow Mary Oliver all the time, let the soft animal of your body love what it loves, right? Allowing yourself to move in the way that your favorite animal would move just waking up from a nap, which of course we call pendicular movement in a scientific term, but it's really about following what feels good in the body because if we go back to listening to the body's wisdom and that gut wisdom, what feels good is nourishing. 
And your body knows that and will give you that that feel good feedback. And so the more that we listen for that and follow that, it comes out of this rote exercise, I must do this shape or this posture into following and listening and letting the body be your guide. Fantastic. I sometimes say something similar. I say, make it feel like you're in a warm bath being massaged by someone who really loves you. (laughs) (laughs) If you can get that to happen, that's always very nice. Can you maybe talk a little bit about how it's really important as, as a psychologist, you know, you're working a lot with people's past trauma, things like depression, stress, and trauma are major mental things. But then A lot of people have concerns which are physical concerns or physiological concerns. Physical concerns, of course, are things like pain, uh, loss of function in certain joints. And physiological concerns might be things like energy drain or immune reproductive uh, dysfunction, stuff like this. And what I've found is that the worst situations are when people have either mental trauma plus physical trauma. And so sometimes I'm telling my clients, you know, you need to relax a lot more because you're stressed, for example. But then when they want to address their physical pain or their seeming weakness or dysfunction, then they have this fear that they're not going to fix their physical problems because I'm telling them to relax so much. What's your take on this sort of thing? Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, you've really named the the body mind medicine conundrum right like that there is this way in which we recognize that there is a tremendous connection between stress trauma and health and you know it dysregulates the autonomic nervous system which is so tied into our endocrine system and our immune system and our digestive system and our respiratory system and so when we have dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system we're, we're much more likely to see autoimmunity and asthma or respiratory conditions or digestive of conditions such as irritable bowel or GERD, right, or the reflux, um, and and uh, or endocrine system dysfunction of thyroid problems, or uh, you know, and so on and so forth, sexual dysfunction, and so what we can then recognize is that the vagus nerve actually tends to be a key to attending to all of that, and that it isn't about just attending to the mind or just attending to the body because it's a both and. And that when you are attending to the state of mind and to your emotional tone and healing your trauma, you are simultaneously attending to the the systems that can be the sources of your pain or of the symptoms of illness. And if we can really get that buy-in from the people that we're serving, then um, I feel like we start to see exponential change. For example, if I'm working psychotherapeutically with someone who is attending to their trauma history with somatic therapies and EMDR, and then they're also integrating a therapeutic yoga practice as a daily practice, or they're, they're joining my group or they have some way of attending to to their stress. They've started a meditation practice. Any of those pieces, we will start to see that that both their physical health and their mental well-being um, improve faster. So it's very much about how do we attend to the both and versus that either or. I think what you said is really important because this connection between mind and body is so integral. And as we started saying before, that if people address their mental state and make themselves feel good and just get around moving, then their physiological health will start to improve straight away. But their physical health can also start to improve. Can I can I maybe just talk a little bit about how... Um, Uh, A lot of people are obsessed with exercise and they have this fear of letting go of their abdomen. And like a lot of physiotherapists will, will shun if I say you should breathe into your abdomen. And a lot of yoga teachers will start saying you must take deep breaths into your chest. And so I'm fascinated and I've tried to do research on on how the diaphragm can be inhibited 
by certain abdominal muscles. So basically, when people try and engage their core or draw their navel to their spine, if they do it in certain ways, it completely disables the diaphragm. But if they do it in other ways, the diaphragm can work. Mm -hmm. And I worked for a while with BKS Iyengar in India, you know, who wrote Light on Yoga for those who haven't heard of him. And, you know, he never mentioned when he do when he's teaching posture or movement, he never mentioned the breath. He never mentioned tightening the abdomen. But of course, the way he got you to move the postures he got you to hold and the descriptions for how to work with these postures caused natural diaphragmatic breathing with a firm core. And in yoga, one of the uh, axioms, as you know, is uh, stira sukham asanam, which in Sanskrit, which means be firm, but calm. Can, can you talk a little bit about your take on, on uh, you know, abdominal strength, core strength and breathing and how they relate perhaps? I love hearing hearing you speak about this. It's it's quite brilliant. Um, I often refer to this, and this was in my Kripalu training, but it's essentially that same axiom, which is that that we're looking for this balance between willfulness and surrender, and that we, you know, in, in the Kripalu tradition, it's described as the two wings of a bird that need to function in tandem for the bird to take flight. And so there is a way in which we want enough focus and and um, willfulness in our practice enough of the scaffolding or the structure of the system to hold us upright right and yet at the same time we want to be able to be free inside of the structure and so if you know you'll you'll see when we get into a little bit of an experiential and movement component that there is this way in which we want to honor that there isn't necessarily perfect posture. What we want to honor is that we want to enhance the flexibility of the range of motion within enough of a containment so that I can actually still sense and feel myself in the movement. Too often we have people that are you know, running and running and running and moving and moving and moving, but they, they've lost the connection to the felt sense of the body along the way. Um, and I think it's what you're describing about that tightening of the abdomen for the purpose of the outer look of a shape. And the it's really much more about, can we access the internal felt sense? And the truth is, is that when we lock up the abdomen and when we lock up the diaphragm, we are cutting ourselves off from the felt sense of the body, right? The more that we brace, the more that we will lose that capacity for the vagus nerve to send the interoceptive signals of felt sense up to the brain. And we need those signals to help guide us in to be as responsive to our world as we'd like to be. That's beautifully said. I love the word interoception, and it wasn't so long ago that I actually learned that word. Can you just quickly explain for the audience what interoception is? Because I think it's such an important thing. Yeah. So um, when we think about our sensory perceptions, I, I generally break it down into three categories with an added fourth. So sensory perception number one is our exteroception. Right? Our exteroception is the five senses. So we use our what we can see, what we hear, what we can smell, taste, and touch are our five senses. And that helps ground us to our external surroundings. Interoception, here's our key word, is the internal sensations of what's happening inside of your body. What's the temperature? Can I feel my heart beating? Can I sense if I'm thirsty or hungry? Do I sense that I need to move now? Or do I, you know, am I tired? Am I alert? Am I scared? Interoception tells us what emotions we're feeling because, of course, the, the felt sense of an emotion lives in the body as well. Number three is. Uh, proprioception. Where is your body in space? And how does your vestibular system give you a sense of how your body's located in space? Am I upright? Am I a kilter? Right? Um, how am I standing? How much space am I taking up? And proprioception is about our relationship to gravity and um, the joints of our body really help give feedback up into our inner ear uh, and the vestibular system, which work together to gather that overall felt sense of self that's a combination of those three exteroception interoception proprioception the fourth 
Yeah, they're like, there's one more. The fourth is added by Dr. Stephen Porges in polyvagal theory, and it's referred to as neuroception, which is that it's our it's related to our nervous system and how our nervous system is always working to perceive whether I'm safe or whether there's a threat or whether there's a life threat. And that neuroceptive input is happening all the time without even having to consciously think about it. So I might walk into a room and react to a situation and not know even why I'm reacting, why I'm bracing. And it's only later that it was like, oh, it was that look on that person's face. I thought they were criticizing me or it was that person's voice tone or there was a smell in the room. So our nervous system is taking in information from our five senses or from the internal felt experience in your body and is determining what level of nervous system uh, state am I in? Am I safe and relaxed? Am I on guard or am I shut down? That's such a beautiful summary. I'm, um, I'm, I'm thrilled you said all that. I was about to say something. The, the, um, the whole idea of the nervous system working like this and being able to look inside yourself the whole time, that really is the epitome of yoga, isn't it? Really, that's what we're looking for, to be able to really sense ourselves and be connected internally. So it's wonderful that you're doing all this. I, I, I have so many other questions that I want to ask you, but I'm really keen to, to see if you can maybe share with us some of the tools physically so we can all try some of them. And if there's time afterwards, I've still got many more questions I'd like to ask, especially about stretching and and uh, how it relates to the stretch reflex and part of the autonomic uh, part of the fight or fight response because sometimes people will stretch and when they stretch passively they stimulate a stretch reflex which really is part of your fight or fight response which might prevent you from falling for example so the way we stretch is important i think otherwise people might be actually causing more stress in their life and exercise can cause stress so i'm sure. You can answer some of that, or we can go straight into our exercise. <laughs> I'll answer. I'll answer just a just a tad bit of it briefly. One is that um, just to loop back to neuroception and your excitement around it and its connection to yoga. I, I speak about this in the therapeutic yoga for trauma book, but the uh, or excuse, yeah therapeutic yoga for trauma recovery. But that there's a um, connection in there between neuroception and svadhyaya, right? That the svadhyaya is one of the core principles or guidelines of a healthy life, and it's about self-knowledge. And I think that while neuroception happens passively and without conscious reflection, we can also bring conscious reflection to what's happening interoceptively and what's happening uh, with, with the state of my nervous system. And now with that self-knowledge, I can actually take more self-responsibility to know what is my body needing at any given moment. And speaking of the stretch reflexes you're speaking about, one of the other things that we learn in polyvagal theory is that the sympathetic nervous system isn't all bad. And it got such a bad rap for so long. But now we recognize that if we didn't have our sympathetic nervous system, we wouldn't be able to play. We wouldn't be able to run or climb mountains or do, do wonderful, active, mobilizing things in the world. So it's really about that combination of how do I do mindful mobilization? Because mindful movement is really different. And it lets us actually be mindful as we go into the stretch that the that we're not going for the biggest, farthest reach of a stretch. We actually can meet sensation and back up from it and work in the zone where we're not at our end range and actually thoroughly enjoy the more subtle sensations that live and in, in uh, before the end range. And I, I can see you're lit up around this, that you work similarly, that there's something really lovely about not pushing, right? About not being aggressive with ourselves in any practice. That's so nice. Yeah, that's beautifully said. It's interesting how our scientific brains, you know, like I also spent way too long at university and uh, we have this reductionist mindset where we want to break the body up into this system, that system, but actually they're all blended together. Sometimes I think of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system function as being like the treble and bass on a stereo system. We don't want to have one on, one off. We want to have both together. And I had one of my friends who was the 35 
35-year-old martial arts expert in jiu-jitsu. And last year, his sympathetic nervous system shut down. And so his heart rate dropped to 16 beats per minute. And it was so devastating that he actually had to be put on a pacemaker. And so we do need our sympathetic nervous system. It's part of that joy of life as well, to keep you excited enough to do things. And the parasympathetic nervous system, I guess, is like that, let's be relaxed. But to be relaxed and excited at the same time, or energized but calm, I think that's the balance we're looking for. They're so intimately related, aren't they? It's so true. And, and I think we're really trying to find that sweet spot. So let's do a little bit of it together. Let's do a little bit of movement. Um, I am just shifting my view so I can see what you're going to see here. Okay, great. So I'm going to shift back here. Um, I want to shift back here so that you can see me just a little bit more um, in space and time. And, and the, the, invitation for any of you that are joining us for this movement portion here is to listen to your body, to know what's happening inside, to take a moment as you arrive. And all of this can be done seated. Um, you, you really can make this as accessible for you as, as you would like. So I'm not going into anything extreme, but I'd love for you to just take a moment and notice the state of your nervous system. What are you bringing into this practice with you? And perhaps your nervous system is a bit stimulated right now from this conversation and how lovely. Notice how that is percolating through you. What's awakened in response to our excitement about this conversation? And you might also notice that there's some the deeper layers underneath that, perhaps even some sadness or tenderness around how your own body perhaps carries remnants of stressful or adverse life events that have occurred for you. And to know that whatever is present for you right now is welcome here. That as we have an opportunity to drop into the body and just a little bit of movement, there is really about a, this is about a listening and an attending inward and a creating space. And you might notice the quality of your own breath. And you might even begin to explore how it feels to soften your own diaphragm, which resides here at the connection of the rib cage. You can even place your hands here or maybe one over the center of your ribs and one over your belly. And to just allow yourself to feel that it's okay to take up space. And allowing yourself to move just a little bit with the breath so that as you inhale, you expand into the hands over your navel and your diaphragm. And as you exhale, you just let that go. And you can choose how active or passive you want that exhalation to be. You might inhale, expand into the space. And perhaps explore active exhalation, drawing your navel back, drawing the diaphragm back. And you might even notice that as you breathe in this manner, that your spine is invited to be part of the dance. And we'll include your heart as part of this dance. So as you inhale, expanding navel, diaphragm, maybe placing a hand now over your heart, letting your chest be part. Filling and emptying. And this movement of expansion and contraction is 
what we find in all life. In yoga, we call this spanda. And it's what we can see in the opening of the flower, at the morning sun, and the closing at the end of the day. And you might allow your arms to come into this motion with your body here so that as you expand, you let your arms open wide. And as you contract, you follow that contraction, honoring that that too serves a purpose, curling in and finding your rhythm with the breath and movement. That often the way that we can work with the held or contracted places of the body is to contract around them. It's the way that we can honor and say, I found you. And that we don't have to remain in contraction. We can come back to expansion. That willingness to take up space and be joyous. And this too is a reflection of your nervous system that we can come in and turn inward with our attention. And we can move outward to the world. Right. We can allow for that rest and that inward turn. Every inhale is a celebration of that sympathetic system. Your heart rate increases, you feel a little more alive, and every exhale is an honoring of the parasympathetic. We slow down. And just two more breaths like this, just feeling that rhythm of breath and movement. And your rhythm, right? You get to honor you, your pace. And then coming back for a moment to reside in stillness. Perhaps resting your palms on your thighs, you're sensing your feet on the floor. And it's in these pauses between the movement that we can really sense and feel what's beginning to change and shift. I want to offer one more tool that for me forms the basis of truly one of my most favorite daily practices. And it's about connecting to the uh, vestibular and uh, proprioceptive system that we spoke about a little bit before. And it's recognizing that there is great wisdom in being able to mobilize through the joints of the body. And I'll invite you, if you're sitting with me, just to start by rotating one of your feet around the ankle and you can go in one direction and then the other. In yoga, this is a practice of uh, removing excess winds from the body. <laughs> it's a Pavan Muktasana practice, and you can take this into your knee by rotating the lower leg around the knee in one direction and then the other. And what we really mean by this is that sometimes we can grip or hold a lot of tension in the joints. And you can take this into your hip by just doing some nice broad hip circles, even here seated. You can do this sitting on the ground. You can do this in bed before you get out of bed in the morning. And you can do this standing if you prefer. Going in each direction and releasing that leg and we'll take the other side. Starting with foot around the ankle. And these can be very small circles, or you can take them as larger circles, and generally about five times in each direction with each joint. And then moving into the knee by circling your lower leg in one direction and the other. 
And so you might feel, uh, or you might even hear it in my body, the little cracks that start to happen when we release the joints. Um, but when we look at how our bodies respond to stress and trauma, we often grip out in the ankles or the knees or the hips. You can take this into the hips, speaking of one direction and then the other. And so this helps to come out of that gripping and create more fascial fluidity in the body. Good. And then placing both feet on the floor. And we'll do both arms at the same time, wrists in one direction, hands around the wrists. How many of us have had those moments where we realize we're holding our hands and fists and we didn't even know it, right? You can take the hands in the opposite direction now. If they were circling out, you can circle them in. Yeah. And the elbows circling, lower arms around in one direction and the other way. And it's such a simple practice but it's profound, right? And then your shoulders, and you might even just let your whole arms enjoy the motion. And as we were speaking about earlier, let this feel good. Let this feel like your favorite animal just waking up from a nap. And you can just take this into what feels natural. It might come into more spinal movement, you might even want to go a little from side to side. So it begins to kind of free up that listening. And remember that we're not going towards any achievement here. There's no goal. This is about following what feels good. And taking another two or three breaths with your free movement. And then returning to stillness when you feel ready. And now we get to sense the inner movement of the winds or what we refer to as the pranavayus. And that there's five directions of inward flow of movement, downward and inward and upward and circulating around the belly and expanding in all directions. And perhaps you can sense a little bit of that here, that you've freed up your own internal energy system. We're waking up that connection between gut brain and head brain, mind and body. And I'll invite you to close this practice out by rubbing palms together. And in the most gentle, loving way, just sweeping your fingertips from center of forehead out. Across your cheekbones towards temples. And from shoulders down to elbows. And you can pause here with a little hug of yourself, thanking yourself for giving you this gift of movement. Hmm. Ariel, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much. I, I, you know, it's very early in the morning where I am. So I had a couple of hours sleep, woke up, tried to organize all my cameras. And so I haven't done anything to connect with myself. So that was so beautiful. I feel alive, alert, awakened, energized, but calm. I feel like I was in a warm bath being massaged by someone who really loves me. And I really appreciate that you mm -hmm. took us through that. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thank you for having I, me here. I so resonate with how, you, how you're working, you know, like I love 
yoga, but I think, unfortunately, in the 21st century, a lot of modern yoga turned into the aerobics of the 21st century, and people forgot that it's all about connection and making loving connections. You know, it's loving connections inside ourselves that are really the model of how we should be in the world and how we relate best to the people around us. So I think that that's what you've embodied and that's what you've shared with us. And I would love to meet you in real life at some point because you speak my language as well. So I, I really 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 enjoyed talking to you do you have anything else you'd like to share with us before we go i think we're almost at the end of our time or maybe how people could connect with you etc sure i i would say um first of all i agree the shared language was such a joy about this conversation so thank you for that um i do have many many uh, classes that are available on YouTube. If you go to Dr. Ariel Schwartz on YouTube, you can find those. Um, and some of them are shorter, gentle practices like this. And some of them are a little more vigorous, really awakening some of that sympathetic for the purpose of play and mobilization and energy, energizing the system. So find your, you know, fi find the practices that resonate with you. And uh, you can stay in touch on Facebook at Dr. Ariel Schwartz on Facebook as well, or through my website and blog. So really lovely to be able to share all of this with you today. Dr. Ariel Schwartz, what a pleasure to be able to spend this time with you. I really do hope we meet in real life someday. I'll be looking at, I've already seen quite a few of your videos and I'll be looking for more. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us and your beautiful practice. Really, what an honor and much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.